The topic of today's video is enlightenment experiences. This is a topic that I should not be talking about, but I'm gonna talk about it anyways. Why? Because I had a lot of green tea this morning and I've just finished the climax of my writing my novel and I'm somehow very jacked up right now. And I was sitting there looking at my uh, YouTube recommendations and Brad Warner popped up and he talked about something similar and it got me thinking. So I wanted to sit down today and I wanted to touch on the topic of enlightenment experiences. So whether we like to or not, or maybe we're a little bit embarrassed to admit it, uh, enlightenment experiences, having them, Wanting them is pretty common when you sit down to meditate. Like mostly we're, many of us, at least when we first start, we're sitting there waiting for the thing to happen. We're waiting for the big shift. We're waiting, as they say in the texts, for the bottom of the bucket to drop out. Now different Buddhism and especially Zen schools have different ways of emphasizing or conspicuously not emphasizing these types of experiences. Uh, sort of the cliche overview of Zen Buddhism holds that the Rinzai school, which is the school that I trained in, the Rinzai school has the sudden awakening project where you train and train and train, and you get pushed in a corner. D.T. Suzuki, the great um, D.T. Suzuki, in one or many of his books talks about how Zen practice is really difficult, Rinzai Zen practice, and you get kind of painted in a corner, is how I remember him describing it. And you're pushed by the rigors of the schedule, the training, the practice, and the resolute, dismissal of all your koan answers by the teacher until eventually you just like have a breakdown slash breakthrough and there's a big opening. And that's kind of the conventional understanding of Rinzai practice and koan practice. I find I run into that notion a lot when people who have read about Rinzai practice approach me and ask about koan practice or enlightenment. On the other side, there's soto practice or farmer or organic Zen. Uh, so there's Rinzai and soto Zen. And soto Zen is thought to be or called the gr gradual enlightenment. So you train and you train and you train and gradually the insights and the openings grow in grow inside of you, wherever. Um, so, uh, for example, Shunryu Suzuki, the great Soto Zen master who started the um, San Francisco Zen Center, talks about how it's like, you know, you're, you're, wa you're out walking in a heavy fog. And it's not like you're in pouring rain, but you walk out there in the heavy fog for long enough and gradually you become to get soaked through. So too, when you practice Zen Buddhism for a long period of time, um, you don't really notice moment to moment a change, but gradually after a long period of time, you are soaked through with the Dharma. So there's a lot of different things to be said about what I just said and shouldn't have said because these things shouldn't really be talked about. It's a bit like discussing orgasms with your family members. Like, you know, just leave it unsaid. It's gauch when you bring it out into the open. But um, one, so what I just did was I put a lot, I, I put these things, I put, I put a type of experience into a category. And the category is as it's, it's been defined and refined over the years within Buddhism, specifically within the Zen school. But th let's go way over here to the Christian tradition. Hello, St. Paul, I'm on the road to Damascus when the light came from above and blasted the scales from your eyes and you fell off your equine steed and you lay in the dirt and the Lord flushed into your very being. I forget, was he going to see the Corinthians? <laughs> Anyways, 
St. Paul had this experience of what the Christians call capital G grace. And if you rhetoric, if you unpack the, if you do an exegesis on the rhetoric that is used to describe that experience, it's like very different than the rhetoric that is used to describe the experience of Zen master Hakuin having his final great enlightenment. I remember I was at a seminar with a uh, Victor Hori, who is this interesting Rinzai Zen scholar. For many years, he had trained as a monk, and he was going to become a Zen master in Hiroshi. And he told me that there was just so much BS politically in the monastery, and even within the tradition at large, that he just walked away from it. That was sort of his, my memory of it, I wouldn't want to misquote him, but, but it was interesting that he walked away from being a Zen master, became a great Zen scholar, and he talked about, um, when I, at the seminar I went to, when the great Zen master Hakuin had this, his final enlightenment experience, and he was just sitting there reading the Heart Sutra, and everything sort of fell into place and, f and fell away at the same time, and he was free. That was his last, biggest, most complete enlightenment experience. Okay, so how do we, how do we, how do we compare these these two experiences from Hakuin and Saint Paul? Is there a comparison? Do do we need to compare them? Like our lineage is totally incompatible. I don't have the answer for that, and I'm not going to get into that kind of a question now. But I think it's important to just note that the school that I practice in, Zen Buddhism, has a very specific way of, of, of speaking to these experiences. And these experiences are, arise with it within a certain context. And I think that, that it's important to, to let go of that context, to be honest, and to let go of our ideas around enlightenment, Satori, Kensho, the grace of God, to let go of all of this kind of, of rhetoric, which creates this competitiveness and creates a kind of insecurity in us and creates a really strong spiritual ambition. And in my experience, all of that winds up obfuscating your own uh, inner light or inner wisdom or Buddha nature. Remember when I first went to the monastery, I spoke with a monk, someone whom I wound up being enemies with, but he remains a source of inspiration for me, actually. He was very wise in certain ways and a jerk in other ways. So I had just shown up at the monastery, a uh, chicken monk or a, or a unsui, um, a monk in training is what I was basically. I was very green and I was feeling some enlightenment insecurity. And I remember this guy said something that stuck with me, and maybe it'll stick with you because I think it's really important. Um, he, first of all, he used the word opening. And I've never forgotten his usage of that word, and I use it to this day still, and I've used it already in this video. He didn't say enlightenment experience, Kensho or Satori or grace or any of the traditional words. He said opening. And I was telling him that I don't didn't, you know, I didn't know about this. I didn't know about this whole concept of, of Satori or enlightenment. And I wasn't sure I'd ever had any of these experiences myself. And I was kind of confessing my insecurity around this um, because I had some. Like I wondered if I, I, I had the chops. I'd read maybe too many books about Zen. And he said, of, of course you've had openings. He said, everyone here has had openings. You wouldn't be here if you hadn't had some, some kind of opening. So relax and get down to work and do your practice. Now I want to make a statement that's um, maybe just indicative of, of how far my head is up my own ass. Nonetheless, I'll make this statement. Um, I would say that you cannot have a spiritual experience or an opening of some kind that is that is beyond 
where you're at. So you can't skip ahead of the line. You can't draw a winning spiritual lottery ticket and suddenly become a Dharma billionaire. I don't think it works that way. Controversial statement of the day could be wrong. May lightning strike me if I have led you astray here. But my sense is with these things and my experiences, somehow it's some kind of an accumulation of karma and momentum, uh, grace, fate, hard work, struggle, suffering. There's really this um, sense, and this is uh, largely how I operate in life, there's this, you've got to put in, things have to accumulate, right? And then there's a breakthrough. And you're not going to break through m more than you've accumulated, or, or you're not going to go fat. You're not going to break through beyond the momentum that has accumulated. And I would say mostly you're working with what you've got, and that is what is used by you and the world to accumulate your momentum, karma, fate, or whatever. So it's. In other words, you shouldn't worry about this sort of thing. You shouldn't worry about having an opening or a Satori or an enlightenment experiences. And this can be tricky because that's a currency in your community if you're in a Sangha of some kind, like especially certain Zen communities. My great friend, Mark Noble, who's also a patron, told me about, uh, hey Mark, uh, told me about a community he was working with for a while that's um, a popular Zen group and they really emphasize the Satori or enlightenment experience. And in, in my opinion, what that does is, is it just distracts you from the nuts and bolts of practice. But as I said, I don't think you can have a spiritual experience that is ahead of where you're at. You can't skip in line. So what I want to do now is just talk about two experiences that I had and I'm going to unpack them a little bit, explain them a little bit, and tie them back into this idea that you can't have a spiritual experience that is ahead of where you're at. So I've talked about this before, and every time I talk about it, the experience gets more and more distant from me and actually becomes encased in and made out of language, which is one reason why it's really stupid to talk about these experiences. So the experience diminishes in reality every time you talk about it. Every time you think about it, every time you you conjure it and try and re-magicalize it, it just diminishes. Um, there's a very clear expression in Zen Buddhism around talking about these experiences, and it is no. Nonetheless, I sally forth. When I was in high school, I was driving down, I think, the 94 freeway in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I had just been at a party and I was young, I was like 16 or 17, um, and I had been at a party and I had danced with this upperclassman and I felt kind of like we were in a gazebo and everybody was dancing, I danced with her and I felt kind of, I was in a, I was in a warm mood and I was driving down the freeway in this clunky station wagon I had. It was so bad, this station wagon. This is a true story. Um, I would, I had hauled some soil, right? And I had left it in the back and then the soil had spilled and it had gotten into the cushions of the car. Then I, then the windows didn't roll up in the back and some rain came in and actually green things started growing out of the cushions in this station wagon, blue station wagon. Was, anyways, I was driving down the 94 freeway in this station wagon after having had this beautiful night and To the right of me, there was an outdoor movie theater, and I, I turned and I looked at it, and I, I don't remember what happened next, but you know, a few moments later, I had this thought in my, it was like this amazing thought arose out of this, uh, I don't know, emptiness or whatever had just happened, um, and the thought was, there's, there is something rather than nothing. 
and I've talked about this before on this channel, this is, this is a very common, actually, insight for Western philosophers to explore, study, and have. It's actually, it's interesting. Like, there is something rather than nothing. And it just, it hit me in all its, like, infinite, miraculous reality that I'm here, that you're here, that a whole cosmos is here. And the fact that there is anything rather than pure nothing is, is, is why I have a spiritual life now. Um, I think it was from this realization that you can't not have a spiritual experience, practice, understanding of reality and of your life after having an experience like that. Uh, there's something that means something. That means everything. You know, there's something rather than nothing. So I don't know how to fit that experience into, I don't know how to shoehorn that into traditional Zen, Kensho, or Satori um, literature. It doesn't seem to easily fit into that. It was an extremely profound experience that changed the course of my life. I, I then sat down to try and capture that experience in words. It wound up being this massive philosophical volume of questions that is now lost to time, thankfully, uh, which then transformed into writing poetry to try and express the experience and then stories to try and capture the experience. And here I am today. That was one very important opening that I had in my life. And I bet if you rake through the uh, ruins of your own past, you can find within that tiny little rubble a hidden gem like that one. Something that happened to you where the light of the universe, the cosmic uh, shunyata, came shining through. I really had too much green tea today. So the second experience I want to talk to you about happened after my first Seichu. So Seichu is a it's like three month training period, intensive training period. So I'd been at the monastery full time. I think it was after my first Seichu. It might've been after the second one, I forget now. So I'd been training full time and it was really intense, et cetera, et cetera. And we had what were called Benji days at the end of a, of a, of a Seichu training session. So after the end of this three month period, uh, I had a few days off and I went into Los Angeles and my friend at the time was living in my old apartment and he was a Zen monk and a Zen teacher as well and he'd introduced me to this whole practice and was mentoring me and he needed to get his junky car washed. Man, there's like a theme running through these of small vehicles, not great vehicles. Um, that's a Mahayana or Hinayana joke for those of you out there who are Buddhist scholars. Okay, so we had to go get his car washed. And I had been doing, of course, koan practice with my teacher, Suzaki Roshi. And I felt, I felt frustrated and excited at the same time, which is a great way to feel when you're a Zen student. <laughs> and I, we were watching, we were waiting for the car to be washed. Some guys were washing it. And my, 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 my friend was sitting on a picnic bench. And I was asking him, I was asking him, like, how do you answer a koan? Just tell me what you would do, you know? And he was sitting on the picnic bench and, and I, you know, I shot at him a koan like I felt my teacher might do in that moment. I was like, how do you manifest that picnic bench you're sitting on, right? Like, how do you manifest something other than yourself? that is yourself. And so he did this thing, he was like, and I could feel what he was doing. He went like, he was manifesting a picnic bench. I kind of like got it. He was solid and sit, a, sit on a bowl, you know? Um, he was not himself in that moment, he was gone. And of course I couldn't quite put that into words and I, and I, and I just kept hammering him with this. And we're going back and forth and we're going back and forth. And then he points up to this flag and this flag was doing its thing in the wind and he said, he said, like, where are you when you see that? Or where is that flag? Or something like that. And then this, I had this, I had this experience where suddenly the, I felt the flag. It's a hard thing to describe, but I, I felt the flag moving inside of me. 
So there was, yeah, I felt the movement of the flag as my own movement. And it, it wasn't intellectual. It was, it was an experience. Um, strange. Ex I mean, it wasn't strange. Um, you know, it was, but it stopped my mind. Uh, and then I, and then, and then we got his car and, and we talked some more and, and I went to my car, um, which was the monastery car. Uh, and I was driving back to the monastery or something. And I was, I remember where I was, there was a Starbucks nearby. I was somewhere in Los Angeles. Um, and I was listening to the radio <laughs> And it was this totally silly song. I was still alive with this experience I had just had of this. The flag was in, moving inside of me, and I was moving inside of the flag. Like, there was no distance and no separation. And it could have been anything, of course. It could have been the flower that I'm looking at now across the room. It could have been the camera that I'm looking at. Like, it... <laughs> yeah. So... I'm driving along and this music is coming up out of my radio and it was a really funny disco song from this like the 70s. And it was like doobly dibla dabla dabla doobly do doobly dibla dabla do something like that and it was very silly. And oh god, I remember this just like bursting out in laughter until I just started sobbing and I was thinking so beautiful like the song can go from there into here and rise up inside of me as joy and it's all one experience and it's me on the road and in, inside this car this car uh in this city this city in this state in this country on this continent in this globe in this cosmos, it's all one thing. It was like in that moment, somebody pulled a lever and every psychological, metaphysical, existential boundary or electric fence separating all the individual things just fell down and all the life inside looked around at all the life and was like, one thing, baby. So. That was uh, an experience that I had as, as a monk. Now, both of these experiences that I've just told you about, the first one being there's something rather than nothing, and the second one being everything is the same thing, <laughs> everything is one thing, these were experiences appropriate to the person I think I was in each instance. Uh, in the first case, I was a, I was a young man who was raised within the Catholic tradition. Uh, I was not prepared for that type of experience by my Catholic tradition, but I think it was appropriate within that tradition uh, to have that kind of an experience. It was like kind of an experience of God. Um, and with the second experience, it was very much informed by my teacher's uh, specific style of Zen, Tathagata Zen. Uh, he spoke over and over and over about the principles behind the experience that I had of s s uh, this and that, or you could say maybe self and other, the boundaries just dissolving and uh, unity, and then that unity breaking apart the next moment and a new self and a new other arising. Um, I think that was that sort of experience that I had with that flag flapping and then that music. When, that, when I heard that music, it kind of brought the experience home. I was suspended in a kind of not knowing after I experienced that flag. And then it all clicked when I heard that freaking goofy disco song. So yeah, that's my Ken show, disco. Um, and then I went to Starbucks and I wrote all this down. And that was also apropos for the man I was and in many ways still am. And I think that obscured the experience a little bit. I think a, a wiser, more seasoned, more talented, more uh, humble, frankly, practitioner would sit 
with that experience and hold it and forget it at the same time and then possibly it could it could really sink in deep roots that's perhaps what what zen master hakuin did when he had all his different experiences uh, enlightenment experiences the next one seemed to grow on the previous one if you really look at the literature on that until there was that final experience which was very simple and complete if you believe the general wisdom on this on hakuin as i've aged uh, and the longer I'm out of the monastery and outside of the context where people can be competitive about Satori type experiences, I have come to let go of, of the idea of enlightenment, Satori, Kensho, all of that stuff. And I've come to place greater and greater value on the every day. Like one foot in front of the other. One, one moment, one moment, one moment. Um, being here, manifesting present moment awareness within the tiny picayune moments of my ordinary life, not reaching for a great experience, but being fully present in the most mundane, everyday, ordinary moments, as well as the emotional highs, not getting too carried away by them, or getting dragged down into the muck of nadir, low moments, hell realm type experiences, but manifesting the middle way, the middle way, right in the middle, right, right on the razor's edge, right? Right where all the different um, extremes collide and cancel each other out. You know, I knew people at the monastery who told me about their enlightenment experiences. Um, one of them uh, was, a, was, a, was a monk and a human being who was very unimpressive, if I may say so. You know, God bless this person, but they were arrogant and vain and flirty with, with people, but then like once they received attention, they would kind of move on to the next person. Uh, they eventually quit Zen practice and kind of just puttered around. And this person had told me about an, ex a, an enlightenment experience that they had had, a profound Satori. And then they told me how they took that experience into my teacher and he just leaned back and he laughed right when the person came in the room. He leaned back and laughed and he went, don't attach to Satori. Ha <laughs> ha. He was laughing. He was like, this is going to be your downfall. You attach to Satori. Don't attach to heaven. Don't attach to enlightenment. Don't attach to Satori. That's what my teacher told this person. And I think it's good advice. Don't attach to the idea of Satori. Don't attach to the idea of enlightenment. Don't attach to the idea of great grand spiritual experiences or you will miss out on the reality of your own life. You'll, like John Lennon said, like life's what happens when you're busy making plans to have an enlightenment experience, right? So there you go. Maybe that'll be helpful. I don't know. You can sit with it. I'm going to sit with it. Um, in the meantime, uh, you can support this channel if you so wish by going into the video description below where I've got a link to my Patreon page. I've also got a PayPal link there. You can support my channel through either one of those options. I've also got the link right here, patreon.com slash Jack Hobner. But I offer these videos to you for free and I hope you get something out of them. I get something out of getting feedback from you all. So leave, leave some comments in the comment section. Share what you're thinking, share what you're feeling, share what your experiences are. 
The algorithms are gathering our information for when the great AI overlord becomes sentient through the internet. So if you leave a comment here about enlightenment, maybe that will help enlighten the future singularity that will arise out of our computers. My novel that I mentioned earlier deals with similar themes and so those sorts of things are on my mind right now. Anyways, that's a long way of saying go ahead and write a comment in the comment section or you can hit subscribe and hit the like button to help this channel out. Otherwise, sayonara folks. Have a great day.